Hi, my name is Sharon Chen. This video is about treatment for tuberculosis infection and disease and prevention strategies and challenges of tuberculosis worldwide. The learning objectives are to describe the differences in treatment strategies used for latent tuberculosis infection versus active tuberculosis disease, to recognize the importance of drug resistance mutation rate and bacterial load in approaching TB treatment, to describe the mechanism of action of the antibiotics that are first-line therapies for TB, to recognize the limitations of BCG vaccination, to identify successful public health strategies and challenges for global control of TB, to articulate the relationship between HIV and TB, and to explain why MDR-TB is a barrier to TB control. Let me first give you a historical perspective about treating tuberculosis. Even after Koch's discovery of mycobacterium tuberculosis as a causative agent of TB in 1882, the disease remained without effective therapy for about 60 years. This was not from lack of trying to find a cure. TB was the greatest killer in the 1800s and early 1900s. Many therapies were tried. Fresh air, sunlight, and altitude were thought to help, which is why many sanatoriums were built. People infected with TB would be treated at these sanatoriums with lots of time spent outdoors in the sun. You can see in the picture rows of children outdoors at a sanatorium. Interventions from bloodletting to giving cod liver oil were tried, as you can see in this image of children lining up to get their dose. Even surgical interventions were tried. Collapsing the lung by artificial pneumothorax was also thought to be helpful. It wasn't until the 1940s that an effective antibiotic against TB was developed. It was called streptomycin. It originated from a soil bacteria called Streptomyces griseus, which belongs to the same phylum as MTB, actinobacteria. The problem was that use of a single antibiotic to treat TB quickly resulted in emergence of resistance. Let me give you some general principles about TB treatment. On a public health level, the rationale for treating TB disease is to prevent transmission of MTB. On an individual level, the rationale for treating TB disease is to prevent death. The photo shows a man in India who is severely cachectic from untreated TB disease and will likely die without treatment. One of the reasons why TB is so prevalent is that the treatment regimen is not so easy. An infected person has to take many medications for many months, so adherence or taking the medications for the entire course is difficult to do. And to make things worse, relapse can occur if the person doesn't complete the entire regimen. The treatment regimen for latent TB infection, or LTBI, is also months long and difficult for people to adhere to the entire course. The rationale for treating LTBI is to prevent an infected individual from progressing to TB disease. On the public health level, the rationale is to reduce the reservoir of MTB in the population. Not only is treatment for TB disease months long, but it is also necessary to take multiple antibiotics, at least three and sometimes more. Treatment of LTBI is different. Only one antibiotic is used. Why is there a difference? The reason is based on the number of naturally occurring drug-resistant MTB present in the tissue. Let me explain what this means. Resistance in TB occurs because of random chromosomal mutations, not horizontal gene transfer, for example, plasmids, as I have discussed for other bacteria. In a population of a million MTB bacilli, one of the bacilli will be naturally resistant to an antibiotic against TB. So how many resistant bacteria exist in a cavitary lesion caused by pulmonary TB disease? A cavity can have about a billion MTB bacilli. So it's predicted that a thousand of the bacteria will be naturally antibiotic resistant even before the bacteria is exposed to any antibiotic. As you might imagine, if we give a single antibiotic to this person, the resistant bacteria will be selected and grow. In contrast, a person with LTBI will only harbor about a thousand live bacteria, so it's unlikely that any antibiotic-resistant mutants exist in this population. So this is why TB disease is treated with more than one antibiotic, whereas LTBI can be treated with one antibiotic. I want to now discuss some of the common antibiotics used to treat TB and their antibacterial targets. You will recognize this map from the Introduction to Microbiology video series. Although the cell wall of mycobacteria is different from other bacteria, it's an important target for antibiotics against TB. Other antibiotics against TB target nucleic acid synthesis. 
Isoniazid, ethambutol, and rifampin are three of the four important antibiotics used to treat TB disease. Let's start with isoniazid. It is the cornerstone of TB treatment, and it's used to treat both LTBI and active TB disease. It diffuses well into the host cells and into MTB. Its mechanism of action is to inhibit enzymes important for producing mycolic acids in the cell wall. Remember, these are the unique lipids in the cell wall. It rapidly kills, or it's bactericidal, for bacteria that are metabolically active. It has a slower killing for non-dividing bacteria, so this is why isoniazid is given for a long time. Next is rifampin. This is another very important antibiotic against TB. Like isoniazid, it can be used for treating LTBI and active TB disease. It is lipophilic, so it diffuses well into MTB. Its mechanism of action is to bind to bacterial RNA polymerase, preventing transcription of DNA into RNA. It is highly bactericidal, and the combination of rifampin to isoniazid has enabled reduction in the duration of therapy. The biggest issue about rifampin is its adverse interactions with other drugs. One drug that I didn't show you in the map is called pyrazinamide. The reason is because the mechanism of action is not so clearly defined. It seems to involve disruption of the plasma membrane. It can kill in acidic environments like the vacuole and macrophages or necrotic tissue, and it's also effective at killing slowly dividing or non-dividing bacilli. So it serves as an important complement to isoniazid and rifampin for TB disease treatment. And the addition of pyrazinamide enabled a decrease of two months in the total duration of therapy. Of note, M. bovis is intrinsically resistant to pyrazinamide. The last drug that I want to tell you about is ethambutol. This is added to isoniazid, rifampin, and pyrazinamide in treating active TB disease when there's a suspicion of isoniazid resistance. The mechanism of action is to inhibit the cell wall synthesis by blocking the polymerization of arabinogalactan, that sugar layer. An important side effect is that it can cause optic neuritis. The specific first-line treatment regimen for active pulmonary TB disease is rifampin, isoniazid, pyrazinamide, sometimes ethambutol, for two months, and then continuing isoniazid and rifampin for four more months for a total of six months. Directly observed therapy, or DOT, is important for ensuring adherence to the entire regimen and to reduce emergence of resistance. The photo shows you DOT in progress. It essentially means that a healthcare worker is administering and watching the person take the antibiotics. Treatment of extrapulmonary TB and TB in HIV-infected people are generally longer. LTBI treatment is different. Usually, it consists of isoniazid alone for nine months. Hopefully, I've made the point to you that treating TB is complicated. Perhaps you've been thinking that preventing TB would be a better approach, maybe with a vaccine. So is there one? Yes, a TB vaccine is available, and it's used in most TB endemic countries. We don't use it in the U.S. It is called BCG, which stands for Bacillus Calmet Guterin, the names of the two scientists that developed it. It's a live attenuated or weakened strain of M. bovis that was taken from a cow with TB mastitis, and it was weakened after 231 passages in culture over a 10-year period. BCG vaccine effectively prevents disseminated or miliary TB disease in infants, and it decreases progression of TB disease in infants and young children. This is why most countries administer the vaccine to newborns. About 85% of the world's population has received BCG, yet a global TB pandemic still exists. Why is this? BCG has been found to have many problems. BCG does not prevent infection from MTB. It does not prevent future cases of adult pulmonary TB disease, and it only prevents about 5% of TB-related deaths. Contributing to these problems is the fact that for 40 years, BCG vaccines were not standardized. For example, different strains were used, leading to widely variable effectiveness. Even the administration was not standardized. The photo shows you a multiple puncture needle, which was commonly used, but produces inferior results compared to intradermal injection. The bottom photo shows you a typical scar after BCG vaccination by the multiple puncture technique. Without an effective TB vaccine, something else is needed to control TB. 
a robust public health system is vital. Ideally, TB control needs to include several components. One of these is to protect people from exposure to TB. This can be done by instituting mandatory reporting of TB disease cases to the public health department. Knowing an index case allows the public health officials to isolate the index case if necessary and to identify contacts of the index case for testing and treatment. An obvious component to controlling TB is to effectively treat patients with TB disease. As I mentioned before, this is best done with a directly observed therapy or DOT system. A third component is to do targeted testing and treatment of LTBI in high-risk populations. For example, as healthcare providers, all of you will most likely undergo yearly TB testing. Globally, we don't have control of tuberculosis, and there are many reasons why. I have already mentioned several. TB is a slow, insidious disease, and treatment is also long in duration, making adherence difficult. BCG vaccine is inexpensive, but inadequate, and LTBI is a silent reservoir. TB is not just an infectious disease. It is also a social issue. TB affects the poor disproportionately, partly because social, economic, and political issues in a country affect medical care. Access to care and antibiotics may be too expensive for some populations. The infrastructure for DOT and contact tracing may not exist. Two other reasons are important to highlight. One is HIV and the other is multidrug resistance. TB and HIV are truly double trouble. TB is the leading killer of people with HIV infection, causing one-fourth of all HIV-related deaths. People with HIV have more problems with TB compared to non-HIV-infected people. For example, people with HIV are 30 times more likely to progress to TB disease, and if reinfected, almost half will develop TB disease in two to three months after exposure. And it's not just problems with TB, there are also problems with HIV. TB increases the risk of HIV progression. To make matters worse, TB disease in HIV patients is associated with multi-drug resistance. As I mentioned before, drug-resistant MTB is a result of selecting out naturally occurring antibiotic-resistant bacilli from a large population of MTB. How does this happen? Generally, it's from improper use of TB medications. Often, this is because of non-adherence to the very long duration of treatment, but sometimes it's because of an inadequate dose of antibiotic or inappropriate treatment with a single antibiotic, and unfortunately, some of these cases of Im Im improper use are due to physician decisions. Resistance to TB antibiotics are called different names depending on which antibiotics are resistant, as you can see on the slide. The important thing to remember is that multidrug resistant TB is even harder to treat. Cure rates are less than 50% with treatment. More than four antibiotics typically have to be given. The duration is even longer, up to two years, because second line antibiotics have to be used. The result is even more problems of non-adherence, more side effects because second line antibiotics are in general more toxic and more expensive. Multidrug resistant TB is a major obstacle in controlling TB globally. So there is some research and development that has been done. Bedaquiline is a new antibiotic approved for treating MDR-TB and the first new anti-TB drug in about 40 years. In addition, some studies have shown that a proportion of drug-resistant MTB isolates don't have identifiable mutations in the known genes, and the resistance may be due to an increase in the efflux pump activity. So there are some early studies that have looked at using existing efflux pump inhibitors to rescue resistant antibiotics. 